Hello, everyone. Welcome to Nails and Beauty Talk. I am your host, Asia the Bird. Today, I have a very special guest with me today. She is a content strategist and a CND ambassador. Please welcome Mary Chia. Hello, Mary. Welcome to the show. Hi. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. I love it. You didn't even have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> You're quite welcome. So I want to go ahead and get started with your beginning. So what was your upbringing like and how did you get into the nail industry? Ah, yes. So um, I'm a Cambodian American I'm nail professional and educator. Um, mm -hmm. And my upbringing was probably pretty I feel like it's probably pretty similar to like most children of refugees where mm -hmm. we had to like, you know, work really hard in school and get the good grades and all that stuff, <laughs> become a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, some mm -hmm. other like super professional, um, super professional career. And that was the path that I was on pretty much. Um, mm -hmm. Did really well in school. I got a full ride scholarship to uh, university. Mm -hmm. um, but when I finished college, like a bunch of stuff happened. Well, Okay, when I started college, my mm -hmm. sister, who was married to a Vietnamese, uh, a Vietnamese man, he was he mm -hmm. came to America as a refugee as well. His whole family did. Um, his mm -hmm. family actually started doing uh, opening nail salons on the East Coast um, mm -hmm. with Chico. He was one of the original um, Vietnamese immigrants that um, came to America, learned mm -hmm. how to do um, nails in well like the seeds started in the refugee camps, um, mm -hmm. which I don't know if you know this story, but the actress, Tippi Hendren, she was mm -hmm. in that horror movie, The Birds. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. probably what she's the most famous for, but she um, toured uh, some refugee camps. Um, and the refugees were really like interested in her nails. So mm -hmm. she was wearing a French manicure. So she brought her manicurist to the refugee camp to kind of show them how it, how it worked. And there was like that seed group of um, immigrants who kind of, you know, spread the, the joy and kind mm -hmm. of changed, you know, disrupted the nail industry and turned it into the multicultural experience that we know it as now. Mm -hmm. So my sister's um, in-laws, they started nail salons with um, Chico, one of those original um, immigrants. And mm -hmm. then my sister went and trained uh, with mm -hmm. her in-laws. And then when she came back to Colorado, which is where we grew up, um, she opened her own salon and then she asked mm -hmm. me to go help. Um, so I was like a senior in high school, freshman in college when that happened. And mm -hmm. then I left, I finished college, um, got married and stuff. And at the end of college, in between, I was um, trying to decide if I was going to go to grad school or um, enter yeah, like go to grad school basically was like my mm -hmm. option. Um, yeah. And my, my family, my sister and my mom and my dad, they ended up opening a full service salon um, in the suburbs over here. So mm -hmm. I was sitting, I just remember like I was married. I didn't want to be in school anymore because, you know, being married was super fun. And um, I wanted to spend more time with my husband. So I was standing at the kitchen counter one day and I was like, what am I going to do? And my dad was like, well, you could go help at the salon. So mm -hmm. then I went to um, nail school, which um, that was super fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went to nail school, I got licensed, and then I jumped into the family business and that was it. I got, I started doing nails and it took about a year to build mm -hmm. a clientele from the ground up. Um, you know, I had, I didn't have a clientele and it was a new salon to the area. It was a little bit further away from where my sister had developed her business, but it was a really beautiful, um, collaborative experience, like with the hairstylists and the estheticians and the massage therapists and the other nail stylists that were there as well. And we all, um, built our clientele together mm -hmm. and then, I got really burnt out <laughs> after about three years. I was doing nails and I was really busy. I was working about 60 hours a week and I was busy mm -hmm. the entire time, but 
I was tired. I was tired. And um, I didn't think that I was good at nails because I kept getting like pocket lifting and service breakdown and stuff like that. So I took mm -hmm. a class with Alicia Bryant Mays. She's an educator. She was an educator in Colorado and she is, has just like the biggest heart. Like anything that she does is amazing. She's a realtor now. So if any mm -hmm. one watching needs um, a home in the Denver metro area, <laughs> Alicia Bryant Mays is great for that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, basically she like flipped my world. Like my, mm -hmm. the, the biggest problem that I had, which was pocket lifting was solved by one solution, which was just, you know, proper mixed ratio. So after that, um, I fell in love with education and I applied to become an education ambassador with CND in 2009. And mm -hmm. I've been with them ever since. It's like, both of these things, the most, one of the most grown up things I've ever done is like mm -hmm. stick with a career and like <laughs> become an educator. So, mm -hmm. and I think that brings us current. <laughs> All, right. All right. Wonderful story. So in terms of being a CND ambassador, how does one get into being a CND ambassador and what have been your experiences like being a CND ambassador? Yeah, um, being becoming an educator, it was an application process. So there is a bidding uh, process. There's a, it's a little bit of photography, a little bit of essay work, and you know just a regular application. And it's on their website if um, anybody want, is interested in like checking out the requirements. Mm -hmm. um, it helps to be a CND Grandmaster, which basically just means that you've taken all of the systems classes. So there's a color, uh, color systems class, mm -hmm. there is a liquid and powder systems class, and then there is a gel systems class. And when you take mm -hmm. all three of those classes, then you know, you're pretty well versed in the like how to use them so that you can guarantee your work with your clients. And mm -hmm. then um, from there, there is a very interesting process called boot camp. That's kind of like, um, that's like the last stage of the interviewing process. There's phone interviews. There might be some mentorship. Um, it kind of depends on the year mm -hmm. that it's happening. So, you know, there's like some virtual mentorship and stuff like that. I think it's going to be pretty, uh, it's, it's similar to, to kind of like what you go through with um, nails, next top nail artist, like that mm -hmm. um, continued honing skills training and then the interviewing that goes along with it mm -hmm. um and then it all culminates into this week-long workshop I guess mm -hmm. <laughs> called boot camp where you learn facilitation skills mm -hmm. um and it's pretty interesting like mm -hmm. there were some people who cried um and it's all really good like as like everybody experiences some kind of breakthrough, but it's a really interesting process. And I love it because the education department does such a great job of like holding space for whatever experiences need to happen. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not like this is the interview, you know, if you fail the interview, then you're not going to be an educator. It's not like that. There's always space to grow. And um, that is yeah, that's part of the reason why I have stuck with education is because um, it has helped me grow. And um, I imagine maybe I've helped a few people, but <laughs> it's just, it's just like, a, it's just a really good community and communal, mm -hmm. um, non hierarchical sort of space for growing. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. Very well said. So in terms of being a content strategist, I want to get into that really quickly. So what is a content strategist and what does that entail? Ah, yes. So content strategy basically talks about marketing. Um, and content specifically is usually free content. So we're talking for nail professionals. It's usually social media mm -hmm. um, content. There might be an email list in there for nail professionals who um, keep an email list and uh, send their emails to their clients mm -hmm. and subscribers. Um, highly recommend that strategy. And then your website is also part of your content as well. So those three mm -hmm. things, um, the strategy part comes when you are using those three things in synergy with each other. So your mm -hmm. website, you think of it as kind of like your base camp, right? And 
Mm. I know there are a lot of people who run their businesses without websites, but Mm -hmm. um, I feel really strongly about them just because, you know, when somebody is looking for a new nail stylist or maybe they're going for, you know, vacation or something like that. Mm -hmm. And where's the first thing that they're going to go? Right. Google. (laughs) Yeah. They're going to go to Google and then your website pops up on Google. And then, you know, you give them a really easy way to know whether or not you're the nail stylist for them, an easy way to book. And then boom, you have a new client. Mm -hmm. And really the only, like the only upkeep fee Mm -hmm. of that is your domain name. So yeah, it's really a low barrier to entry, but it gives you kind of just like that next level of credibility. Like there's that digital footprint where any search engine around the world can find it if they Google nail salon, Mm -hmm. Denver, Colorado, you know? So I I feel really strongly about websites. And then um, if I can nerd out about that a little bit, there are some really interesting um, key elements that you can use on your website um, Mm -hmm. to give those like visual cues that you are the right person for um, the person who is visiting your website as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, As you know, we're like a highly, highly visual uh, group of people, right? <laughs> Us nail professionals and our clients. So using big images um, is very important. And what I like to, I like to tell my um, nail professionals that the images should always be of people who are kind of like your target market. So mm-hmm. for instance, you know, like you have a great portfolio, um, your Instagram is like perfectly styled and your nail skills are amazing. That's awesome on Instagram, but on your website, the first picture that your clients want to see, you know, if it's, if you're like really pushing nail art and that's the thing that you want to sell, that's great. Mm -hmm. However, if you know, you're like me and you're more about like the community feel in your salon and that um, one-on-one relationship, then maybe Mm -hmm. you want an image of somebody who fits like the person that you are, um, Mm -hmm. that you're serving, you know, young moms, um, older professionals, retired people, um, you know, that kind of thing. And then down the line, um, you can sprinkle in uh, pictures of your work. And that's just one of those like subconscious cues that you can use to um, draw the right clients in. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's your website. And then your social media, that is content as well. Mm -hmm. And the visuals, again, like we usually take care of them because it's usually pictures of our work. Where we as salon professionals can really, um, you know, hone in and reel in our people is in the captions. So it kind of just, again, you know, tailoring it to the type of client and the type of person that you're trying to attract is really important. So Mm -hmm. for instance, you know, somebody who is wanting to get booked for editorial work Mm -hmm. might address, you know, stylists or, um, editors, that Mm -hmm. sort of thing, people who are actually looking for content, you know, so there might be a little Mm -hmm. bit of an education element in there. It might affect the type of hashtags that you use, but people who Mm -hmm. are, um, you know, actually looking for clients, um, their education might be a little bit different, you know, like you might, you might drill down about home care and how to make your nail polish last. Mm -hmm. Um, You might want to talk about, you know, how nail art is, you know, the perfect little detail to carry you through like three weeks of life. (laughs) How it's like that, it's that little extra boost of um, confidence or just like detail, you know, that your client needs. So Mm -hmm. Um, There are a lot of different directions that you can go with this. And so I always, you know, that that's the good part about content strategy, though, Mm -hmm. is that when you know who you're talking to and you know what you want them to do, then you can just keep on talking to that that person and get to get them to do what you want them to do um, in a way that helps them, of course. And there's still plenty of clients for everyone to go around. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Very well said. So in terms of with the salon, like how does one, like if they want to open up their own salon or nail studio, 
what is like the best choice for someone to start, whether it's move rent, home, mobile, like what's your whole take on that? Oh, okay. So I don't think there's any one wrong and right answer. <laughs> I think the the worst thing that you could do really is just to kind of like try and copy somebody else who has something that you think that you want. Mm -hmm. um, like for me, I personally thrive in environments that have like a few different people in there, you know, like so that I can observe and just kind of like vibe with. And one thing that I really love to do actually is refer people to um, other people. Like I'm a total fangirl. <laughs> um, I think that's kind of one of the things that makes um, my content uh, work really, really well. That's like one of the um, one of the reasons why I do good work for my content clients mm -hmm. is because I can put my, myself in the customer's shoes and you know, know what they want to hear. So for me, building with cross referrals between hair clients and massage clients and mm -hmm. um, esthetician clients worked right. really well for me. I'm like, oh my gosh, this hair girl is like amazing. Go to her. Mm -hmm. um, and then the hair size would send people to me as well. And then it would just kind of like ripple out like that. Mm -hmm. um, however, you know, one of the um, people that I share my suite with, she strictly stays mobile and mm -hmm. she is growing. She, that's how she grows her business. That's her main focus of growing her business. Mm -hmm. um, so she will go to people and then use referrals that way. Mm -hmm. um, and she has been growing her business that way. And then she, she funnels them into the studio um, after that. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it really depends on what you, how you thrive, how you, how you enjoy making connections. Um, the one thing that you might want to consider, like if you are considering between like an employee position at a salon or opening your own space mm -hmm. is that generally speaking, it takes about a year to build up your clientele. So the financial mm -hmm. aspect of that might have something to do with it. You know, like, do you have um, a cushion where you can like pay your booth rent or pay your space rent, you know, mm -hmm. however, however often that goes, um, do you have a cushion for that as you start to build up your um, business? And it is 100% possible. Um, you'll probably spend a lot more time in the beginning, you know, yeah. marketing, focusing on that content strategy, if we're going to stick with digital, you know, focusing on posting and um, honing your craft and really directing people to your uh, booking site so right. that yeah, so that you can start to build your clientele that way. So just know that it might be a little bit more of an investment on the content side as you're starting out and to have a little bit, you know, of that financial um, wherewithal as well mm -hmm. when you are considering it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the way that, so, sorry, um, just a quick note, the way that um, as far as like pricing and stuff like that goes, mm -hmm. That is a really important element of your business period. So like if somebody's starting out, you know, what is your service menu look like? And can mm -hmm. you write your service menu in a way that people will book? And the most important thing on that for me personally is like the pricing part. Is the pricing right? Um, so that it can sustain you as you are building your business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Now, what are some tips could you give for someone who wants to build their own clientele or build like a, a, a group of people where they can target them, you know, for their salon? Mm, yeah. So in person is important. Um, well, if you're talking in person, then, you know, always wearing your nails you know, always wearing your own work and carrying your business cards, you know, that that's the stuff that they tell you in nail school. And mm -hmm. that's the stuff that still works. Um, in like on social media, definitely having a clear call to action. So, mm -hmm. you know, telling people how to book and uh, utilizing your profile bio, your profile links is really um, key 
just in mm-hmm. case, you know, somebody's scrolling and they're like, oh my gosh, this person is in Colorado. Like, um, I totally want to go there. Um, hashtags help with that. Dynamic content helps with that as well. So mm-hmm. like, you know, if you have a bunch of pictures of nails or nail videos, you know, on Instagram mm-hmm. um, or TikTok, like definitely mix it up with a little bit of um, content just about you. Like, you mm-hmm. know, like what you're watching right now or something like that. Are you a TV person? I am a TV person. I'm a TV person too. What are you watching? <laughs> um, I usually watch like reality TV type shows, mm-hmm. but um, yeah. I watch a little bit of like, you know, different like art shows. Um, I used to watch uh, Skin Wars. Skin Wars was pretty cool. What is that? What is Skin Wars? So Skin Wars is a talk show where um, there's competitors that do these, this amazing body painting work. That's really cool. So, you know, I like watching that type of stuff. I remember when Nailed It also um, used to come on Oxygen. I used to watch that. That's a really cool show as well. Okay. See, see, like that is like such a cool way to like connect with people is through, you know, art, all different kinds of media of art too, right? Like Mm -hmm. fashion, I don't really understand, but like TV, I (laughs) definitely understand. (laughs) And that's what, um, that's what my clients and I talk about. So talking about things like that in your content is great too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Yeah. I'm into art as well. I'm an art uh, student. I always like looking at other people's art. Um, I graduated from uh, Savannah College of Art and Design, so I've learned different avenues of art, you know, and it, and it's really cool to see, like, not just on TV, but on YouTube as well, you know, you see everyone that has a different style of art, you know, social media, you know, you get a lot of inspiration from there, most definitely. So also in terms of with salons, how does one maintain good customer service? Oh, that is so good. Good customer service is just... <sighs> I think the biggest thing is a couple of things, um, empathy and boundaries. So, you know, knowing what works for you as a nail professional can really help set expectations for clients as well as yourself. Because like, Mm -hmm. you know, if a client comes back and, or, you know, like if they say something kind of out of turn during an appointment or if they come back and they say that they're not happy with a service when you know your boundaries about how to um, how you're going to handle those kinds of things mm-hmm. it makes it so much easier and it takes the like you know that like initial zing of the emotion out of it you know like you can you can remember that it's not personal because most of the time people are not out there to like you know hurt uh, their nail professionals feelings. It's just that there's like, it's just like, there might be some sort of misunderstanding or maybe it is like an honest, um, you know, something happened to this nail sort of thing. So, you know, uh, creating the boundaries around communication around Mm -hmm. how long you are going to, um, you know, guarantee your work, um, under what conditions are you going to guarantee your work, um, booking, all of those kinds of things, like we usually think about, you know, when we're talking about our policies and stuff like that, we think about, you know, um, booking policies, deposits, cancellation policies, things like that. But Mm -hmm. things like communication, um, guaranteeing your work, um, even like the kind of stuff that you're going to talk about, like a lot of that stuff, you can set your expectations for your space so that you're you know, your customers are coming in and they know the rules of engagement, which is another reason why I love um, websites. Um, Like that's just one place where you can house all of that really important information. And then when you know your boundaries and when you know that when you have the confidence that you have like, you know, you are coming from over here and you don't necessarily have to, you know, jump into your client's skin or into their business to try and like, manage their reaction or their response to anything that's happened Mm -hmm. you you it's a lot easier to come at it from yourself as opposed to over there like trying to fix something um and that also you know that that will help you to communicate more clearly and with more empathy and that will actually when you know where you stand that helps to um 
it helps to make you more empathetic and understand where your client's coming from too. So it's not all necessarily the nail professional or the salon professional's job to do the customer service, right? It can be a collaborative thing between the salon professional and the client. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. In terms of salons, in terms of business, in terms of paperwork, how important is with documentation, insurance, invoices, and things of that nature. So if you can get into that, that would be great. <laughs> the, the super nerdy, not sexy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So all of that's really important. It's really, you know, one thing that I still struggle with right now is like documenting my processes and my procedures. Um, mm -hmm especially for like the outside stuff, you know, like mm -hmm. the finances um, in particular. Insurance is easy because that's just like set it and forget it. It just renews every year. If mm -hmm. you are a nail professional looking for um, good, uh, good insurance, by the way, um, mm -hmm. check out the associate. Uh, associ it's A&P. I forget if it's Associated Nail Professionals or the Association of Nail Professionals, but it's nailprofessional.com and they offer a pretty decent um, insurance package for nail professionals. And um, mm -hmm. it's, it's nice because it doesn't feel like they're trying to just like take advantage of us because we're wow. self-employed, you know? So mm -hmm. definitely check that out. Um, but other insurance agents, of course, you know, insurance companies have good uh, policies as well. Mm -hmm. So I like to set that and forget it. Um, Definitely file your your business name with the Secretary of State. So that helps, that one thing helps to establish your business as legitimate. So, and it makes it, things so much easier. Um, like when you're trying to get a bank account for your business, you know, a bank account for your business, we know that we're supposed to keep our business money and our personal money separate. Um, so having and, you know, a personal checking account is fine for that. However, when you want to start to grow, like when you want to start to expand, if you're going to go into your own salon suite, um, if you even want like a business credit card, having a business bank account um, will help with that. And then, you know, when you go further down the road, like when you're trying to buy a house, for instance, um, mm -hmm. When your business has been, you know, registered with the Secretary of State, like that mm -hmm. helps to build that business history so that you can get a home loan easier, a car loan easier, you know, all that kind of stuff that, you know, feels like it's just like life. Mm -hmm. um, but your business is supposed to help sustain mm -hmm. your life and help you thrive, you right. know? So, yeah. So having the proper, proper <laughs> paperwork and documentation is very uh, helpful and important with that sort of stuff. It mm -hmm. feels like, and you don't have to do it right away necessarily, but, mm -hmm. um, typically the sooner that you have it, the better it is. It, it's like a, just think of it like a gift to your future self. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then the other thing about that, that I would say is just, you know, stay on top of your accounting. You mm. don't have to use like QuickBooks or anything like that. I just use a Google spreadsheet to track my expenses and my income. Mm. Um, but that will save you hours and hours, you know, when it comes tax time. And, you know, it's really helpful information to have as well. Like when you, especially if you're just starting out, if you're a salon mm -hmm. professional just starting out, you don't really know how to price your services. You don't, um, you know, you're kind of maybe just copying somebody that you saw, which is, you know, fine, but you, you don't want to stay there. Um, mm -hmm. You want to, as an independent salon professional, you want to look at your own expenses, your own personal expenses, and use mm -hmm. that to inform your service prices because your business is supposed to sustain, you know, your mm -hmm. whole life. Right. Yeah. Most definitely. I definitely agree with that, you know, because you have to consider in terms of pricing like services or if you're selling a nail, a nail product or anything like that, like press on nails or anything. Yes. Of course, it's charging what you're worth. Of course, it's, you know, considering the materials you use in terms of yes. cloth and materials and things of that nature. So I definitely agree with that. Now, in terms of trademarking, I want to get into that a little bit. How important is trademarking and how important is understanding an LLC? Mm. Okay, so trademarking is, I don't know too much about that, but the general, like, I don't know the ins and outs of, of that, but trademarking generally is basically registering, you know, like, um, a concept. Typically it's like a, you know, like 
a name, like a business mm-hmm. name or an image, that sort of thing. Trademarking means you're registering it with the government so that people cannot um, steal it later right. down the road. Uh, and they can't, you know, use your brand to make money. Um, whereas an LLC is a filing, like the way that you classify your business mm-hmm. with the um, local government. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you can, for instance, you know, you want an LLC versus like a sole proprietorship, they Mm -hmm. have different liability issues with them. So if you are an independent salon professional, then registering as an LLC will help to protect your personal assets. Um, Mm -hmm. Just in case, you know, like if there's like some sort of complaint um, from your business, that Mm -hmm. person can't um, litigate and take your personal stuff. Like it protects your personal um, assets. Mm -hmm. but with trademarking it's it's almost like you know like watermarking your nail art (laughs) right just so that people yeah just so that credit is where credits do and it does give you some sort of legal backing um Mm -hmm. if you do see somebody using some uh, a name or you know something like that similar to yours um Mm -hmm. one of my non-salon clients recently actually last summer during you know peak covid clearly this other person had nothing to do (laughs) but she owned a a yoga studio in texas and it had the the pronunciation of the name was the same but it was spelled differently so she sent a cease and desist to my client in colorado um Mm -hmm. who is also a yoga studio and even though like the you know the the concepts were completely different um but because Mm -hmm. both of them were yoga studios and it was the same pronunciation of the name um, mm-hmm. my client had to change, <laughs> had to change their thing. Otherwise they were going to get sued for way, way more, you know, than it would have mm-hmm. cost to just change the name. So that's the power of trademarking, um, for salons, you know, it's, how do I want to say this? <laughs> it's, it's an, it's a, it's just another step that you can take to protect yourself, you know, like mm-hmm. having insurance, um, However, I feel like if you don't, like if you're not going to branch out into a franchise or, you know, include products like press-ons, like you were talking about before, um, I don't think it's necessarily the, it's not necessary. Um, I think definitely if you're thinking about trademarking, check your energy behind it. Like, are you just trying to like, protect yourself and protect your baby, you know, or is it to set a foundation for, you know, your new baby to grow? Right. I think that, that will kind of give you a clue as to like, whether or not trademarking is right for you. Right. Right. Very well put. So in terms of like, I'm going to get into nail distribution, um, because I've interviewed people such as Hazel Dixon, um, who is a nail distributor and who sells like different brands, like not only just her brand itself, uh, HD Pro, um, his professional uh, nail products, but also accents. So how is it important to understand like nail distribution? Like if, if one wants to get into it, how important is understanding the ins and outs of nail distribution? And how is it important in terms of keeping up with inventory? Oh, yeah. So inventory in general, um, you know, that's something that it's, that's definitely above my pay grade. So (laughs) I would recommend, you know, asking somebody who has, um, who has experience in manufacturing and also like projecting that Mm -hmm. the biggest thing would be like planning. Definitely. So that you can actually forecast how much you're going to need and how much um, to actually produce. So once Mm -hmm. you actually source, you know, your production facilities and stuff like that, um, then how much you order and then how much you bring in and how much, you know, you sell it for and stuff like that. It's very similar to how we actually manage our retail product in in the salon as well, except we're lucky and we don't have to actually make that stuff, Mm -hmm. (laughs) make that stuff and come up with the marketing, but all of the pieces are still there. There's like, Mm -hmm. you know, um, 
gauging the interest. And a really big part of that is like marketing as well, which content strategy comes into that too. It's like when you can use your, um, you know, what you already have, your skills, when you can use your skills Mm -hmm. to show people how they can elevate their skills, then Mm -hmm. that's like a great part of it. That's like, that's, um, it'll sell itself. Right. I most definitely agree. In terms of products, I want to get into selling no products. So how important is understand to produce a good product and how important is supply and demand? Mm, supply and demand. In the nail industry, I feel like just from what I see, mm-hmm. if you can create something new and innovative, then that creates, you know, instant demand. Mm -hmm. But then there's also this demand of things that like the foundational products that um, keep people coming back as well. You know, it's Mm -hmm. kind of like, um, like the bread and butter and then the, you know, maybe like this, the sparkly like jam or the sugar (laughs) that you put on top of the bread and butter, right? The Nutella. Um, So both, both, you need both of those things. Mm -hmm. Um, in our industry. And both of those things fuel supply and demand. And yeah. What was the first part of the question? (laughs) I started thinking about food. Um, You said how important is supply and demand? Yes. And then how important is what was before that? It was how important is producing a good nail product? Oh yeah. Okay. That part. So that part to me feels really related to like that foundational part of it. Mm -hmm. And when I think of like producing a good nail product, again, I think it kind of goes back to the intention, right? Like, are you creating the nail product just to make a quick buck? Um, Or are you producing this to, um, to really like serve your clients and give them something that they can use to elevate themselves as well. And I think a big part of that is um, the science and the chemistry behind it too. Like, I don't know, you know, a ton about this part of it, but like, um, you know, there are some chemicals that are banned from, you know, cosmetic use and um, some, you know, some nail products still contain those products. And I don't know why, but I think that is a really big thing to um, pay attention to when you are developing products. Um, Just me personally, that, you know, doing due diligence and um, doing your best to not cause harm you know, mm. down the road, because if you are creating something um, that could potentially harm your client's client, then mm. that is, that just doesn't feel ethical to me. If you did your due diligence and you missed it still, you know, then that's just human nature, human people making mistakes, right? But if you know that there's this list of, you know, chemicals that you're not supposed to use that are not approved, you know, um, by health regulatory bodies for uh, Mm -hmm. cosmetic use, but you're still using it because it gives you the effect that you want, then um, there might be some questions to ask around.